Well, let's look at chapter two. The Bible gives hope. Not interested. No, sorry. No, not interested. <laughs> <laughs> far, it's far too, far too simple. I, I'm not interested. I'm sorry. Yeah, but do you agree with it? Um, it's a while since I've read it. It's just... It, oh, it, how do you know that it's too simple then? Because it, it's written at the level of a child. I'm, I'm interested in lesson 13, page 55. Well, I've discussed... A lesson I don't I don't have to dis I I don't have to, I'm not a Jehovah's Witness I don't have to spend my time doing this if I don't want to indeed you don't right and I'm I'm only prepared to do one chapter so I'll discuss one topic it's from your book and I don't want to do the first five chapters because they are they are very very simple and I agree with a lot lot of what's what's in those chapters anyway you do agree with it mm. yeah yeah so you agree God's purpose is for people No, who I've, said, I've said I'm not willing to do that, David. Well. Are you willing to look at chapter 13 or that's lesson 13 am, on yeah, page 15? Yeah, I'm willing to look at okay. that, but I would like to know whether you said you agree with the first five chapters. Well, I'm not willing to do that because I don't wish to discuss them. I'm not willing to but, waste time. I, 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 I'm not willing to, cons you know, I've read it and... I've moved on and I'm not willing to go back and waste any 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 time on them. To me, it would be well, a waste of my time. Oh, well, I would say that our discussions are becoming a waste of time. Because... If I don't want to do chapter two, I don't agree. have to do it, David. Well, the same applies to me. Yeah, we well, do you, would you want to call it a day and we don't speak again? Or do you want to look at lesson oh, 13? Or well, would you like to look at, would you like to suggest another chapter to look at? Right, all right, let's do chapter 13 as you suggest, right? Okay, thank I'll you. Be, I'll be happily discuss that with you. And then we take it from there. Okay, um, it's paragraph two, because I don't want to read the whole chapter. I have read the whole chapter, but let's just look at chat, um, paragraph two on page 55. How does false religion misrepresent God by its actions? Do you want me to read or do you want to read? Yeah, I'll read that. Okay. False religion does not treat people as Jehovah does. The Bible says that false religion's sins have massed together clear up to heaven. For centuries, religions have meddled in politics, supported wars, and caused or approved the death of countless numbers of people. Some religious leaders enjoy a lavish lifestyle and demand money from their followers to pay for it. These actions prove that they do not even know God, let alone have the right to represent him. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my, my question here is, it seems quite quite strict what your book is saying that any religion that has an involvement in politics or warfare is basically a false religion yeah and any religious leaders who have a lavish lavish lifestyle and at the same time that they have a lavish lifestyle they're demanding money from their followers to pay for it these would also be false religions well the, it says that some religious leaders do that Right. But yes, I would. Jesus didn't have a lavish lifestyle. Right, David. I uh, will. I, I interrupted you. Sorry, sorry, David. Jesus didn't have a lavish lifestyle. Neither did um, the apostles. Um, some Jehovah's Witnesses are quite wealthy. Some of the early Christians were quite wealthy. Um, so that's, you can't just look at someone and say, if you've got a lot of money, you're a false Christian. I, you've got a final. I agree. It's people who ask for money for religious purposes whilst living a lavish lifestyle, yes? Yes. Yeah. So, um, but, but on JW Broadcasting, when it first started, people noticed that some of the governing body members were wearing gold, solid gold Rolex watches. Mr. Hurd was sporting a $20,000 Rolex Submariner watch and Mr. Uh -huh. Hurd a slightly cheaper Rolex. Um, uh -huh. they, don't, they don't wear these watches now, but Correct. you must admit there are numerous appeals for funds on JW Broadcasting. Yes, but it doesn't pay these people. 
I mean, I, I was paid by the um, Watchtower Society to come up to Scotland. Oh, you were I a got... circuit servant? No, I'm a special pioneer. Oh, a special pioneer. All oh, right. right. Yeah. And I got £17.50 a month, plus a clothing allowance once a year. I think it was once a year of a similar amount. So the those who work at all the Bethels, including the governing body, all get token allowances for their necessities. What these people did before they became witnesses was their own business. Some of them are quite, um, were quite well off, some were not. So the fact that he had a Rolex watch to, uh, watch to me is neither here nor there. He certainly didn't get it because he was a member of the governing body. You don't think that the shareholders would have given the governing body members Rolex watches? No, for the no, doing? not at all. Not at all. They don't get um, dividends. I don't think the governing body anyway are divorced, I think, from the shareholders as such. It's just the shareholders are there because you have to have some organisation to own property. And so throughout the world, we've got innumerable um, companies. They're all charity. They're all charities and all are examined by the Charities Commission. Our congregation is a charity. Um, and so there are benefits that the government allows to charities, but they have to strictly adhere to a certain rules. So they certainly don't get, you don't get rich being one of Jehovah's Witnesses, and that applies to anybody who is a witness. Mr. Morris, however, drives a Cadillac. He, he, he was filmed going to Bottle King, um, uh -huh. a shop um, specialising in various liqueurs, um, uh -huh. uh, 17 miles from, from Warwick. And uh -huh. he spent um, he spent almost a thousand dollars on McClellan's whiskey. Apparently, he right. he really rates that. He was actually filmed in Bottle King with a trolley loaded down with lots of um, lots oh. of bottles of McClellan. It was he spent nearly a thousand dollars in one go. Okay, well, all I can say is so what. Okay, he didn't win it. Um, all right. <laughs> okay, I'm I'm sure if. I'm sure if the Pope or the leader of the Baptists or, or the Archbishop of Canterbury was filmed buying a thousand dollars worth of McClellan's whiskey, I'm sure uh -huh. the Jehovah's Witnesses would be the first to condemn them for doing that. Not really, because what what was he doing with it? What was he doing with it? Did he ta was he going to drink it all? Was he going to drink it with friends? Was he going to distribute to different ones? I have no idea. Mm. And so I'm sorry if that okay. doesn't make me say he um, has a lavish lifestyle. Okay, all right. Um, your, so your 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 book what says. About, what about this matter of meddling in politics? Does that exclude someone from having God's approval? Well, your book says yes, but. What do you say? But the Watchtower joined the United Nations in 1992. They took yes, out NGO why they, membership. Why did they do that? Um, I, would, um, I would imagine to get um, protection for their leaders when they travel abroad, because if you're a third world nation and yeah, you... To, I think it was to get some information from them. No. And later they decided not to, be, not to join them. No, no, they did actually join them. A governing body yeah. member called Lloyd Barry, who's who's passed on, unfortunately, since then, signed them into membership. He signed the forms in 1991. They were granted membership of the UN in 1992. To comply with this membership, they had to um, promote the aims and the um, the aims of the United Nations, which they usually did in the Watchtower <coughs> magazine. So whatever the theme of, for the United Nations was for that year, that would be the same theme for that particular Watchtower article on the work of the United Nations. Um, you didn't have to join the United Nations to use their library. 
that only happened, that rule was only implemented after 9-11. But in 1992, um, anyone could go into the United Nations building to use their library. You didn't need to be, be become a member of the, of the United Nations to use, to use their library. Right, I will, I will check that out because I'm, I'm very hazy on that, I have to say. Hmm. Um, are, are you aware that The Guardian produced an article accusing the Watchtower of hypocrisy on the 8th of October 2001? Well, the Guardian paper? Yes, The Guardian newspaper. Uh -huh. They accused the Watchtower of hypocrisy because your literature at the time, such as Revelation, its grand climax at hand, said the, that the United Nations was one of the wild beasts of the book of Revelation. It was, a, it was completely of the devil. Uh -huh. And yet the Guardian said you joined the United Nations in 1992. <coughs> and the Guardian accused you of hypocrisy. Uh -huh. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Just going to get a drink. Do you mind? Yeah, sure. Come on. Yeah, I'll be back in a second. Okay. <coughs> I think I'm okay now. You're all right. I was um, I was um drinking some coffee. I've got a coffee machine with ground coffee granules, and all of course right. some of the ground coffee granules get into the cup. Right. So when you drink the dregs of the coffee, I probably, I had a coffee granule or two stuck in my throat but i think i'm okay now oh well that's good <laughs> but the watchtower has never sued the guardian newspaper for libel why 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 didn't you sue them for libel if this story is a complete pack of lies uh i don't have a specific answer to that united nations um, I've got a letter from Paul Hoffiel, who's a section chief for the NGO section at the United Nations. Uh -huh. uh, it's written on United Nations headed paper dated the 11th of October 2001. And he basically says in this letter, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of New York applied for membership in 1991, were granted membership in 1992. And then in October 2001, they requested termination of their association, which was granted on the 9th of October 2001, the day after the Guardian article. And apparently, Paul Hoffiel has sent out thousands of this, this letter because people all over the world were inquiring about the Watchtower's membership of the, of the United Nations. Uh, fair enough. And 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 why haven't you taken? Why hasn't the Watchtower taken Paul Hoffiel and the and the United Nations to court and sued them for libel? We don't, we don't tend to take people to court. You do. There's a we there's a take... there's a guy on YouTube who who makes Lego characters. He has little uh -huh. Lego models and he moves them, little Lego characters and Lego cars and Lego buildings. It's a little Lego Lego town called Dub Town, and he just pokes mild fun, innocent humour at the Jehovah's Witnesses, and the Watchtower's oh. taking him to court in America. He's had to get an oh. American lawyer. Um, the guy who who um, runs it is known as Kevin McFree. It's not his real name, um, but he's he's been taken to court by the Watchtower for simply. Um, producing lego so the watchtower so will, will so that's lego. pardon for simply producing lego yes videos with little lego characters i think it's called stop motion photography you sort uh -huh. of photograph the lego <coughs> then you move it slightly you take another few photographs then you move it all right so y you you take hundreds and hundreds of photographs of, of Lego I characters, I think it's called <coughs> stop motion photography. And I like Gromit on the television. It's similar to Wallace and Gromit, but it's made out oh. of Lego, not. Uh -huh. And and um, I mean he he, and he's um, exposing quite a few things that go on in the Watchtower that he thinks are are, are rather bad, 
and the Watchtower suing him and he's had to get a lawyer in America. This is an ordinary guy. He's not a millionaire. He's an ordinary uh -huh. guy. And he's having to defend him, himself in the court um, from the Watchtower. I don't know why. Um, I don't know what he's done that they are fighting against and uh, taking the court on. So I couldn't comment on it. Well, if you go to YouTube and type Dubtown, you can you can see the videos. They're, they're absolutely fantastic. All right. Um, and all they are well, are little Lego characters. Uh, and and he doesn't use any bad language. There's no four-letter F words or anything like that. Um, but the Watchtower doesn't want criticism, you see. Even I, even I was taken to court last year. Two elders here in Devon uh -huh. uh, complained to the police about me. And it went to court. It was, it was actually thrown out of Plymouth Crown Court. Oh, um, right. I think it was August 2021. I don't think it was September, I think it was August. I think it was the 13th of August last year. And uh -huh. I had to attend all these court meetings back and forward, uh, over and over again, over several months. And then at the very last moment, the thing was thrown out of court. Uh -huh. So please don't tell me that Watchtower doesn't take people to court because they've taken me to court. Well, they tried to, or rather two local elders did. And this Kevin McFree, who produces little Lego characters. It, it, I mean, it's very, very well done. He's a very clever guy. You and know. do you know why they've taken him to court? Because they don't want to be criticised. And he uses humour, light, uh -huh. gentle humour. It's like Wallace and Gromit. All of the little is it characters... misrepresentation? Pardon? I said, is a misrepresentation? There'll be some reason for it. Well, it's, it's, it it's, it's not the Watchtower, it's Dubtown. And the characters are Lego characters. I understand. Yes. I don't know, I can't comment, and it wouldn't no. be sensible for me to do so without knowing the full sure. uh, full story. Yes. Um, yes. I mean, you're throwing things about to me that you're aware of that I'm not even aware okay. of. Well, you can look into it. David, that you can look into it. I will have a little look. Um, um, the, the, in the Watchtower magazine itself, yeah. they have twice admitted to involvement in warfare in the Watchtower magazine itself. But perhaps okay. even more shocking than that would uh -huh. be the fact that they get share dividends today. They get share dividends today from the Henrietta M. Riley Trust. She's a woman who died in 1945. She was very rich. She bequeathed that um, all of her assets should be sold and administered by a Detroit bank, which charges a fee. And all of her assets have been turned into shares, a portfolio uh -huh. of shares. The bank runs this for a fee. It produces annual accounts, which are sent to the IRS, Inland Revenue Service, the American Inland Revenue Service <coughs> for tax purposes. Uh -huh. So that's how you know about the Henrietta N. Riley Trust. The sole beneficiary... Henrietta and Riley. Yes, Henrietta M. Riley. R-I-L-E-Y. And the sole beneficiary is the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of New York, which gets uh -huh. between half a million and three quarters of a million dollars per year, roughly. All right. And what did she do? Um, well, we don't know. She died in 1945. She probably was a Jehovah's Witness, or she, she liked them, because she... As I say, Henrietta M. Raleigh is an independent trust. The dead can't own anything, so she doesn't own it. The Watchtower doesn't own it. The bank doesn't own it. It's it's autonomous. It's self-owning. But the share dividends every year go to the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of New York. And some of the shares, they have investments in arms companies, such as Honeywell, Northrop Grumman, which makes the B-2 bomber, and Boeing and and there's other companies as well which make military equipment and the watchtower bible and tract society of new york accepts this money every year henrietta riley trust yeah right okay i know nothing about it so i cannot comment okay well, um all i can comment on is the teachings and 
the teaching is that um, Jehovah's Witnesses believe, I believe, are correct. My, I believe yes. Jehovah's Witnesses preach throughout the world. We charge nothing for all the literature that we disseminate. Um, obviously, it has to be supported. And so if someone wants to make a donation, they can do. But we have never had donation boxes and passed round uh, little envelopes for people to put money in and to... In other words, we don't we don't try to coerce people to give anything. But there are Every, ways of paying online now, aren't there? Like like the evangelical <coughs> churches, you can pay online. Oh, yes, I I give them I donate money to them online, but they can, they facilitate in this digital age our ways of doing things, and that's yeah, that's right. They also. Um, you can do it as a gift aid if you pay tax so that they can recover the tax that you would have paid on the donations you make. Uh, that is just being sensible, isn't it? There's nothing wrong with doing that. To me, the scripture, by their fruit you'll recognise them, is an important one. And you have to say, who is doing God's will today? Well, everyone says that they're doing God's will, but the group down the road don't do God's will. They're just following the teachings of men. The Mormons no. say that they follow the teachings of God. You don't. The Pentecostals they, say they follow the teachings of, of God, but you don't. Yeah, but You're you, following men. So that's what a lot of religious groups do. The Seventh-day Adventists will say only they are obeying the teachings of God, you know, keeping the Sabbath, paying tithes. Um, doing this, that and the other. They're the only ones doing these 28 rules that I think the Seventh-day Adventists live by. Who else is doing this throughout the whole world? Obviously, only the Seventh-day Adventists, according to Seventh-day Adventists. So there's a tendency to say that what we teach is the teaching of God and groups that aren't, aren't connected to us obviously aren't teaching God because they're doing their own, their own man-made thing. That's how a lot of religious groups think, you see. That's fair enough. I mean, all you can do is you look at it, you make a decision for yourself. Sure. And, you know, we're not here to force people to do something. If they don't want to do it, they don't have to do it. If they believe it's wrong and hypocritical, that's entirely up to them, if that's the way in which they feel about it. Um, do you think that, I mean, there have been Watchtower articles um, the most shocking was the 15th of May 1918 and that's page 6257 of the green reprints uh -huh. Rutherford knew he was about to be arrested and go on trial for sedition uh -huh. Uh -huh. because of the publication of the Finnish mystery so in that watchtower to try and cover himself in court he promoted the purchase of the Liberty Bond also known as the Liberty Loan this was <coughs> money you could give the American government during the First World War to support the American war effort in the First World War. Now that's in yeah. the Watchtower, supporting the American military in the First World War. Back then, they did. They also prayed for the Day of Peace or the Year of Peace. They weren't entirely um, neutral. Yes, so Rutherford, that, yeah. Rutherford played, prayed with Catholic and Protestant clergymen, didn't he? Yes, they, yes. so yeah, they were not entirely neutral yeah. and yeah. gradually these um, false acts, if you like, were cleared up. But yes, there's no doubt. To, I mean, they started off with a clean sheet, uh, sheet, if you like. They accepted everything the church believed until they started to examine them. They used to keep birthdays. They kept Christmas. Um, they did lots of different things in early years. And gradually, these were weeded out as the time went on. Yes. They prayed for the... Uh, I can't remember it was the day or the year of peace, and which was not in being entirely neutral. Yes, that was that was 1918. Unfortunately, no no pictures existed that yeah. to my to my knowledge. However, Rutherford was entirely exonerated because he was able to practice as a judge uh, after he came out of prison. Well, so, actually, yeah, okay, yeah, but Rutherford was actually a lawyer, not a judge. 
All right. Well, he did, actually he did judge on certain occasions. He, he judged for two days. Judge. He judged yeah. for two days. The judge was sick, and so as a senior lawyer, um, Rutherford took the bench for two days, yeah. I believe. But yeah. he only ruled in cases where the people, uh, where there was no literal trial. It was just a formality where the person had admitted wrongdoing, and so Rutherford okay. had to hand well, out the sentences. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Um, well, there that's was why also, the time is up again. <laughs> um, there's one more thing. In Australia, in the Second World War, um, uh -huh. the Bethel sent young men who volunteered for Bethel service to work in military canteens on military bases and also, quote, working in machine shops producing instruments of war. Right. That's in the Watchtower for the 1st of June, 1947, page 173 yep. and I found out that these machine shops that it's referring to this is just in Australia by the way only in Australia and this 97 1947 watchtower is looking back to the end of the Second World War oh didn't have time to finish that yeah um just just to say that um oh you can hear me Yes, I can yeah. hear you. David, um, in that watchtower for the 1st of June, 1947, page uh -huh. 173, uh -huh. I don't have an original copy of this. I'm working, I've am working. i worked from PDFs that I downloaded. Um, <clears throat> in Australia, in the Second World War, which had finished two years earlier in 1945, uh -huh. this watchtower says that the Bethel, and it is actually saying that errors were made, the Bethel had uh -huh. sent young Bethel volunteers to uh -huh. work on military bases in canteens and also, quote, working in machine shops producing instruments of war. And I uh -huh. found out that's the Taylor Craft Aircraft Corporation, owned by a very wealthy Jehovah's Witness called Mr. Taylor, who owned his own aircraft corporation. He employed many Jehovah's Witnesses. But during the Second World War, Taylor Craft just made military aircraft for the Australian military. Uh -huh. So there's two examples in the 1918 and the 1947 watchtowers uh -huh. of Jehovah's Witnesses being involved with the military. Yeah. Not picking up guns and fighting, but um, s supporting the military. Yeah they, yeah, they weren't neutral, were they? Okay. <clears throat> All right. Well, look, thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Um, That's okay. Appreciate your patience. Thank you. No problem. Nice to have chatted to you. I wish you well. I don't think our discussions are going to change anything. Um, you've obviously looked at Jehovah's Witnesses quite thoroughly and decided that they don't represent God. Well, that's no problem. That's If that's how you feel, that's entirely your, your choice. It's, it's not a matter of my choice. Jehovah is a God of truth. And Jehovah Indeed. would never choose an organisation that is so duplicitous and dishonest. That's the issue. Know. It's it's the lack of truth amongst the leaders. I think <clears throat> ordinary Jehovah's Witnesses who sit in chairs in Kingdom Hall, some of them yeah. are sincere, decent people who really are well-meaning and very hard-working and have many commendable qualities. But the leadership, the shareholders, and I think that the governing body are really sort of very hard-working gophers who do what they're told. I think the real power is with the shareholders. Um, these people are very dishonest. You think the power's with the shareholders? Yeah, yeah. Hey, no, that's... Um, <laughs> it was members of the governing body, of course, who were the shareholders initially. Well, but it was then Russell. They all... Sorry? Yeah. Russell owned a lot of the shares. We don't know what happened to them when he died. Well, he put, he put uh, a quarter of a million pounds. His father owned a lot of drapery stores and obviously did very well. And Russell put his quarter of a million pounds into starting up the publishing and all the rest of it. Oh, he put all his money into it. Mm -hmm. However, thank you very much, David. I've enjoyed the discussions with you and I wish you all the best. Okay, me too. Bye-bye, David. Bye. Yeah.